I've had them lie about buying beats, wasting my time. I had a rapper steal an entire album worth of beats and put it on the platforms. I've had rappers disrespect me. Does that give me a right to mistreat every other rapper that might want to get beats from me? No, that's childish and it's bad business. Good morning, everyone. What's going down? It's the MEC podcast. My name is DJ Payne One. My voice is going, but I swear I feel better. So if certain words just don't make it out of my voice box, I'm sorry. COVID is a real bitch. Uh, I'm joined by Dame Ritter and Aaron Knight. They both have 100% of their voices there. So take solace in the fact that we're not all a complete and total vocal mess. Well, we're glad you're feeling better, Payne. Um, This week was a long travel week for me. I was at Canadian Music Week uh, speaking. Travel was a hot mess from L.A. to Toronto and back from Toronto to L.A., I think, with all the COVID protocols. I just don't think, you know, companies have figured out how to way figured figured out a way to operate. Um, Actually, I'm lying. LAX is always a mess. Um, but just layered with COVID, I guess it makes it even more ridiculous. Um, but it was dope. I was on a panel uh, with a company called Musio and a company called Audio Shake. So what Audio Shake does is you can pretty much put any song, upload any song, and then it'll split it into all of its stems. So you can just upload a wave or an MP3 or whatever. And it actually works pretty well. She showed me an example before we, um, uh, the CEO, Jessica, showed me an example before we uh, started our panel. She uploaded an Aretha Franklin song um, and she split it into all of its various stems um, and it sounded amazing. So I would imagine from a producer standpoint, does any, do you use anything like that, Payne? Would, would that be something fun to play with? What, yeah, how do, yeah. What's your response? Absolutely. I use um, RX-8 right now, and that does something similar. Like if I want to remove the percussion from a sample or something, I can do that pretty well with that program. So, yeah, it seems pretty cool. I'm not a creator myself, so I wasn't familiar with, you know, competing products, but it it did it pretty cleanly. Like you can hear the different um, instruments. Um, So for an artist, for example, if you're on tour, something happens to your computer, you can probably upload your songs to their system, you know, and, and just kind of just download the instrumental um, straight from a single file and it might be able to save your show. Uh, but I, I could probably think of a lot of different use. use Syncs. That would yeah, yeah. save me on like my artist will land a sync for a song six or seven years old. And then they'll be like, oh, but I don't know where the instrumental is. And I don't yeah. really have with that producer anymore. And it's like, yeah, like I've literally had to say bye to money because we yeah. didn't have a wave instrumental. So this is tight. It's like stem player, but <clears throat> not just the device, you know? Because right. I think that's the technology that Kanye was essentially saying, like, I have this incredible technology i think he's probably going to be way more expansive with it you know because like remember i told y'all i'm like i don't feel like he just has this device but that's tight i okay it's called it's called music shark no audio shake shake, audio shake. all right yeah. send that to me i'm hype <laughs> dope yeah no she she brought up that use case the sinks um you know i think that's big um but yeah, it was a dope, dope, dope conference, dope panel. I didn't get a chance to to attend too many other panels, um, but it seemed to be pretty well attended. A lot of suits. I don't think it's really for artists. Ticket price is really high. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know if I should be disappointed by that or if that's just kind of the, the focus of the conference. Um, but anyway, what's up with you all? What are we getting into? So, so I, I tweeted recently that producers should treat rappers better. And, you know, I, I came from the other side of that fence. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But basically the reason why I say that is because we're making beats and they're buying them. You know, if, if they're our customer base, we have to treat them better. I see a lot of producers posting memes about negative memes about rappers, uh, commenting negatively about rappers. I think the biggest narrative in the producer community is rappers don't pay for beats. 
obviously that's not true because there are thousands of tens of thousands of producers making a living licensing and selling beats. And the money that Beat Stars paid out over two hundred million. million. So that's two hundred million. Where is that money artists. coming from? It's coming from rappers. So if mm-hmm. you're pushing this narrative that your customer base doesn't actually purchase your services, you're sabotaging yourself. Because one, you're convincing yourself and demotivating yourself uh, of this false narrative. Two, you're you're alienating your fan base by putting out that energy. You know, if your energy is my customers don't want my product, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a stupid way to think. And it's an even stupider way to conduct yourself on social media or in business interactions. You know, like if I'm a, a cashier at a grocery store and someone walks up, I'm like, man, you don't want to buy these groceries. You don't want to pay for these. What kind of interaction is that going to be? It, it, it's ridiculous. So, yes, some rappers waste our time. Some rappers don't want to pay. Some. That's not the point. If we focus on the ones who aren't paying for our beats, we'll never attract the ones who are buying our beats. we got to appreciate the ones who are. And we have to treat them better. We have to create better end user experiences, better customer experiences to expand that group of people that are purchasing the beats. And, and I've had rappers do me dirty. Don't get me wrong. I've had rappers steal money from me. Thousands. I've had them lie about buying beats, wasting my time. I, I had, I've talked about it on the podcast. I had a rapper steal an entire album worth of beats and put it on the platforms. I've had rappers disrespect me. I've had rappers. This is an ongoing problem that I talk about. File the, the PayPal chargebacks. You know, does that give me a right? to mistreat every other rapper that might want to get beats from me. No, that's childish and it's bad business. On a personal level, it's childish. It's messing up my energy. On a professional level, it's terrible, terrible conduct. So when I posted this this tweet, it showed me how, I guess, deeply hurt and self-victimizing the producer community really can be. I got a lot of weird replies. I would think it would be a given. Like, of course you want to treat your customers better. But a lot of a lot of the responses were like, nah, no. Nope, we're not treating rappers better till they respect us. One, I just want to share two responses. One was too often artists express the sentiment that they should not have to pay for a producer's beat. Okay, too often. So what? What does that have to do with you? And number two... Um, this one, I think, was the weirdest one I read. It said, how many other businesses do you know that would let the, the client that hired them to provide a service put them through hell? Literally every single one. I was about to say, every industry, what do you mean? Yeah, the moment I, somebody pays, they think they owe you. Even before they pay. Do producers really think that they get the most abuse over teachers, over nurses, over Uber drivers? over delivery drivers, over service industry workers, even lawyers and managers. Everybody with a nine to five has complaints about customers and clients. And some of them are really bad. Don't even get me started on like sex work. Come on. We're making beats and people are paying us for it. How can we not appreciate that position that we're in to the point that we're projecting all of this negativity onto potentially millions of people we've never even met. It doesn't make any type of sense. So if you're watching this and you're one of those people that's on the fence about either buying this whole narrative that rappers are these awful people that never pay for beats and and you should just <coughs> succumb to the narrative and become bitter, don't do it. The other option is this, keep your head down and work and treat people with respect by default. By default, we all had people screw us over in the past. And if we act on that, we're weak. If we act on that, we become exactly what we dislike. We, be, we, we perpetuate a cycle of abuse. We, we're, we know better than that. If we don't like it done to us, why, why would we spread disrespect? That, that, that never made sense to me. You got the Beat Stars hat on. Where the Beat Stars is celebrating 200 million 
paid out to its creators. This is not the time to double down on a narrative of self-defeat and bridge burning. It's just not. This is the time to look at the landscape and do better. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously a lot of producers, it's, it's probably coming from a lot of producers that aren't getting any sales or not getting any placements. So it's, it's coming from a place of frustration. Well, no wonder. And, I, and, and, and I, to a certain extent, I get that. But any business that has inventory, um, there's a concept called shrinkage that they account for. So it's like shoplifting, fraud. Um, so Target is going to, you know, going to factor that in and, and account for that. Uh, but it's never something that they publicize or they're not talking to shoplifters. So every business has people that take advantage of them, steal from them. Um, but it's not something that you should focus on publicly, in my opinion. Um, and they don't base uh, their business model off that. They don't say no more sales because because people steal too much or um, no more <coughs> no more cashiers, no more greeters. We're not going to be friendly to customers anymore because our shrink has just went up by by two percent over the last year. Yeah, but they but they 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 obviously don't want a high percentage of shrinkage, so they're doing things behind the scenes. Whether it's you know more security, uh, putting sensors at the front door, whatever it is, you know, I think producers can can do the same. Um, in terms of putting some controls in place by maybe providing better service, being more clear about what the terms are. Um, there are things that you can do to prevent people from stealing because maybe some of those people aren't necessarily stealing. They just don't understand how to conduct business yet, right? That's why the MEC exists. Um, that's why a lot of platforms exist to educate the creator community because you know some people just don't know that they're doing something wrong. So that's what I would focus more on in terms of like, how can I, how can I reduce my shrinkage? Right. I guess it's not technically shrinkage from a producer standpoint. It's, it's I guess, I, I don't know who cares, but you can do some things um, to, you know, to, to stop people from stealing or just to, to have people do better business with you. And that's what I would focus on. If well, I yeah. And even when something bad happens, there are, there are, uh, methods too you know we talk about them all the time i talked about the the tracking number method for paypal chargebacks beat stars has beat id um and and uh, publishing that you can sign up and collect your royalties on even if the beat got stolen there, there are a lot of ways to do this uh so i, I yeah, I don't know. There's well, every option. The SOP. Board. That's what Dame, <clears throat> Dame is talking about, like processes. If you have a standard <clears throat> operating procedure or process, then people are suddenly like, oh, they have their business together. So you're not going to attract the type of people there because the reason that people steal from the corner store and they have to have the everything locked up is because they don't have security like Walmart. Yes, Walmart still gets stolen from, but they don't have to chain everything up, you know? So it's like, if you, when people reach out for a beat, if you send them back a form and it says, hey, this is how the sell of the beat goes, da 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 We converted with one of my artists, 10,000 features, $10,000 worth of features in 48 hours. We had <clears throat> a big moment. Adam 22 posted about us. Suddenly my artist is like, I want to run a feature sale. I said, okay, send them all to my email though, because you're going to get a ton of people trying to play games. I came up with a, a standard reply. I said, you must have your money ready. This is how it's going to come. Your, your, your feature will come in four to six weeks. You know, I gave them everything. So there were no complaints. We had a couple people who tried to play games but for the most part the money we had 10k cash in in 48 hours you know what i'm saying but you got to just be prepared but you also attract what you focus on and you grow what you focus on when i used to talk about all this stupid dms i would get all the time i just kept getting more dms I rarely, let me not say rarely, it's way less prevalent now. It's only a couple times a week that I get dumbass DMs versus multiple times daily. 
the Excellence Academy, I used to always be like, I don't think artists really want to spend money on somebody teaching them the business side. You know, we do the MEC for free. And I used to be like, man, I don't think so. When I finally launched it, I have a really large group of people, who, a larger group than I thought interested and ready to spend money with me monthly to teach them how to do good in business on the business side and on the artist side. And so it's like, if you believe that this is where you're supposed to be, focus on getting better at what you're doing instead of focusing on the people who are distracting you from the goal. Indeed. All right, Payne, do you have any, any last words on, on that topic or should we move on to Aaron's topic? Yeah, let's move on to Aaron's topic. Okay, cool. Aaron, what's up? Okay, so my topic today is about diminishing returns. This is something that I wish as a young manager, I would have known. Um, so the concept of diminishing returns is that you're putting energy and time, effort, money into something, and it's slowly gaining. And then eventually, the money, effort, and energy that you're putting in is not uh, equal or worth the return that you're still getting. So there's always an, an initial investment phase. There's always a time where your effort will not equal what you're putting in. But for me, I didn't hear this term until like a year or two ago, right? So I understood the term about two years ago, but I never even heard it quantified as such until recently. I don't have a business degree. Everything I've learned in the music industry has just been me trying to figure it out. So <clears throat> when I heard the term, I immediately started switching things that I was doing. Like for instance, I don't believe in touring anymore. And everybody's like, oh, I want to get on the road. I want to tour, da, 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 da. Unless somebody else is paying for it, I don't believe in throwing tours anymore. Just because how expensive it's gotten to travel, how expensive venues have gotten, all the extra insurance you have to have because of COVID. And I, I'm looking at attendance across the country and attendance to live events is down. Now, y'all may see Bad Bunny's tour or sell out, whatever. But in the independent music scene, people who could sell tickets pre-COVID with even a bigger audience now on the internet still can't sell the same amounts post-COVID. At least that's my experience. So I don't believe in touring anymore because touring costs so much money to put everybody on the road. And then you don't really get what I can make on one tour. If I think about my biggest artist right now, a month of touring will probably come home with $10,000. So that's about 30 days on the road, probably 45 days of prep, 15 days post, that's 90 days worth of work, plus team, whatever. By the time we pay everybody out, I personally am maybe walking home with $1,000. <clears> I threw a festival though. We didn't have to travel about the same amount of prep time, right? Post and pre, but I'm only in Atlanta and I'm flying people into me way big, way bigger crowd on the festival for three days. We're probably walking away with $15,000 and more of that is purely coming to me because we're paying out roles now. Right. So I think about that and. Some people will say, oh, it's the same effort. It's the same amount of days, but touring is so hard on your body and it's so hard on your mental. It's so many things. You end up hating your artist by the, I always have to take a break from my artist. <laughs> like, always. And then I'm not paying a tour manager to go out because most tour managers need you to hold their hand. I'm not going to pay you to be out on the road and I still have to answer all the calls at night. Right. So that's something for me I'm just not interested anymore. So that was a diminishing return for me, L looking at the years that I spent touring and then trying to go back to that. So I want to encourage one, young managers, young business people, what, evaluate your business like it's a business. What are you putting effort into that you're not getting a return on? And again, if you're in the first even three years of something, this is not for you to apply that to. But if you have longevity and success, if you have some time in the game and you have things that are making money, go evaluate those. If I would have kept looking at concerts like, yeah, I'm still making money, like even a concert, even not touring. 
Concerts, I still make money off of. I'll probably make $1,500 if I throw a concert. But the amount of effort and energy is so much similar to a festival. Why not wait and make 10 times that? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'll just wait a little bit longer. And then when I throw festival, like, this is something I'm noticing. Throwing a show, anybody can do. Throwing a festival, not many people can do well. So I'm already getting speaking gigs. I'm getting consulting gigs. So now I put, again, same amount of effort. Now I'm getting paid more for stuff. Now sponsors are way more interested in working with me. A concert's not going to do that. A tour is not even going to do that. But you sell out a venue that's massive in a major A market in hip hop, you're going to see how that return comes to you tenfold, not just in money, but in opportunity. So again, if you're an artist, manager, producer, whatever, evaluate your business, see what you're spending the most energy and effort on. There are lost leaders again. So this is another thing. I consider music a lost leader. There will be things that you spend money on and time on that don't make you that money, but they lead to other things that make you a ton of money. So evaluate your business holistically. Does this stress me out? And it's only giving me $200 a month. <clears throat> Does this frustrate me? And it's only giving me $1,000 a month. Can I put more time? I spend less time a month. The least amount of time that I spend makes me the most amount of money. I spend three and a half hours every month teaching the Excellence Academy, and it makes me the most money. But management is what I spend the most time doing, and it makes me the least money. That's why I've been phasing out management slowly. If you come to me now and you want me to manage you, it's impossible. My whole team has to now manage you, so I don't have to spend time on the things that I want to do, which means you have to be making quite a lot of money, right? So for anybody to even call me their manager now, they've got to be making legitimate, legitimate. I'm not even talking about in the six figures. You know what I'm saying? You got to be making some serious money to leverage the team, like high six figures at this point. So I, I had to evaluate that for myself. It doesn't matter that I'm a good manager at this point. It matters how can that, can it serve me the same way that I'm serving it? So that's something, just a little tidbit, go check your business out. What are you spending time on? Is it making you money? Is it making you happy? Is it worth what you're doing? Everything doesn't have to make money. Again, Dana said this before, this podcast right now is not making any of us money. I don't care though, because I love it. I want y'all to be educated. I want y'all to understand. I want a place where I didn't have coming up. So if I can contribute to that, if I can give voice to that, perfect. So it doesn't have to make money, but it has to make sense for your life. So go evaluate what you have going on and, and eliminate your diminishing returns. I definitely would agree. Um, I know some people that are going to hear, oh, like, Touring doesn't make money. I thought touring was, you know, the most where, where artists made the most money. Um, and again, I told everybody before that every artist has a different revenue mix. Some people make most from touring. Some people make most from, most from music is different. Um, I don't know what the numbers are across the board. I, I saw um, Eric Abel, who we've had on um, the MEC. He's a, a booking agent. Talk about ticket sales um more recently i think just being more like people are waiting to the last minute to buy tickets and i think overall like maybe tickets are down but on the flip side i know art some artists are still doing very well i was just at the saba concert a couple of weeks ago you know his show was packed my stepdaughter just went to i think there's an artist named umi I don't know, but she, I think she just went to her show two days in a row. Uh, so some people are still winning in touring. I think it just depends on the artist. Like I'm currently in the process of putting together a tour for Big Ja, uh, a whole crew of stupid tour in October. I think comedy is a little different because there's much lower overheads and there's not as many people that need to travel when it comes to comedy. So, you know, the, the business model is a little different, but I definitely agree with what, what you're saying, especially the last piece in terms of looking at the return is not only financial, um, but there may be some other thing that you want to consider because um, it may not be about money or it may not be about money right now. Right. Cause you know, it, touring is an investment. You want to tour, put on a great show so that that 200 turns into 400 turns into 800 and touring can be a profitable part of your business. Um, so. Yeah. If somebody else wants to go out 
and do that. I just got too many years in it for me to be going out on tour and not making money, you know? And I think yeah. artists like Saba and Umi, they, they got, they're on a pretty good level. If you're a newer artist and this is an investment, cool. But even my artists, the only tours they're going on now are tours people just taking them out on. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to throw a tour. So we can yeah. still tour, but Wanda well, just you- went out on 500 or 5,000 cap rooms and most of them were sold out. She made she made, I'm talking about 21 dates. She made $2,000. Sheesh. Well, yeah, because you, you guys, me, you guys somebody are somebody took her out, <laughs> that shit is not for me. Yeah, no, I get Because you also are the booking agent, Syra. So you're, you're putting together the tour, right? As opposed to me, like we're working with Gersh to put together the tour. So it's much less stress on me. You're doing what we did in the early days of funk volume. So I know how stressful that piece is. I'm, I'm definitely not putting together a tour myself at this point. Um, so I feel you pain. Any, any, any thoughts on, on that or should we move? Any, I always get, I always get triggered when we start talking about touring. <laughs> you have bad experiences. You want to share a bad experience pain? Um, I mean, I'll share one. It's not you. bag. I, <laughs> I do like touring. It like you said, every every artist's revenue model is different. And in addition to that, every artist's touring circuit is different. You know, touring circuits really do make a difference. If you're touring like the strange music type circuit, that's very different from touring, you know, the the mid-tier EDM DJ circuit. I I don't know necessarily what circuit I was on for a lot of my tours. I guess it was two different ones. Yeah, I there was this one time, you know, you you're always trying to save money on tour. So the biggest mistakes that we made were um and this was this was with when I was on tour with Soul was allowing the promoters to accommodate us in their homes. <laughs> yeah, don't ever do that. It's like a 60-40 chance that it's going to be a horrific situation. Um, I'm trying to think. A couple of them, I couldn't sleep. because I have that. so many stories on that. So I, I believe it. If, if a promoter offers to, to uh, let you stay at their house when you're on tour, just say no. And and don't um, if it, hopefully you got accommodations from the promoter, even a cheap hotel, even a hotel with like drug addicts in it is a better option. I'm telling you, I've stayed in apartment buildings where the promoter starts having sex. I'm like the fuck. I'm trying to sleep. You know, I just worked. You're like busting a celebratory nut over there because because the show did well. I'm trying to sleep. I hate you. Like I will get up and and kick whoever's on top off of the other person in the middle. I'm so frustrated. I just want to sleep. I got 12 more dates. We've slept in houses where they literally threw unwashed sleeping bags on the floor and there were flies spawning in the bathroom. And (laughs) that actually, like the sex thing, we didn't anticipate. We were blindsided by that because it just happened at four in the morning. But when we walked into the to, to the house, I had like rotting rotting food in the sleeping bags. We just walked out, and they were offended. This was in um, this was in Germany. They were offended that we were walking out, and we at like two in the morning were in the middle of Germany trying to book a hotel. <laughs> so that, that's all we we learned. We learned from those those experiences. Yeah, that's all bad. I think um, the most ridiculous experience that I had touring was something that was pretty public. You know, Hobson did a tour um, and then he made a song about this because he just decided to leave his tour. But he was he was tell he started telling people not to come to the show. So he was turning into an anti promoter. And then like he's just decided to just leave the tour and he, he left um it was fort collins we had a show i think it was a sold out show and he just decided to leave um and then he created a song about it 
and made it more dramatic. He said that he like left and went to an abandoned building when the truth was he just had a girl come pick him up. He was just over it. And it was just, you know, that was just, it was just pretty ridiculous to deal with. We eventually came back to Fort Collins and, and, and made it right with the fans there. Um, Hobson is a true artist. If that's what you want to call it true. I don't call that a true artist. I call that ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, obviously when an artist just leaves the show, it puts a lot of stress on the manager to kind of manage the communication, figure out how to make it right with the promoter. Cause obviously the promoter is now stressing because you have a shitload of fans here that wanted to see the main act. Cause I think the, I think this was, I think it was a the other. I think Dizzy and Jaren might have been there too. So they did their set, but then when Hot was supposed to go on, he was just gone. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the some of the stuff that managers have to deal with, and just kind of patching up communication, trying to make it right. You know, so how much do we get paid? Do we get paid nothing? You know, do we owe money? Like you know, so we have to figure all that all that stuff out. Um, but touring, you know, hopefully you enjoy touring. It's going to be rough in the beginning. Um, but you know, you get to a point where you're really, you know, I'm not an artist, so it's easy for me to say, but you're really only working two hours a day, right? Like you, you get to a point where you have a bus and, you know, it might be boring cause you're on a bus all day and you, maybe you're playing video games or maybe you're just doing like social media or whatever, but you do, you come out for the meet and greet, which is about an hour. And then you perform for about an hour. So you know, I can't tell an artist not to complain about that. You might have some issues. You might have some anxiety and things like that that are that are valid. But technically, it's not a lot of work, right? You're working two hours a day. Um, it kills me when artists are like, oh, I'm so tired. Tour is so tired. And I'm like, <laughs> like, I have to work a full day then do manual labor, then drive. And I'm also trying to take care of everything at home, but you're tired. Okay. The crew is doing, in my opinion, a lot more, or depending on which member you are of of the crew, you know, everybody has to be there a lot sooner than you have to be there. You know, they start setting up, let's just take the merch person, for example, you know, they're setting up hours before, uh, tearing down probably an hour or two after counting inventory. Um, you know, so in terms of the hours worked, they're working more hours. I'm not going to say harder. I lost the label saying words like that, but I'm saying <laughs> they work longer hours than, you know, than, than the artists on tour. Anyway, uh, my, my quick topic was um, I didn't know that artists were still faking independence, right? I didn't, I didn't know that was still a thing because I know, you know I, know, I know Logic did that back in the day. Like he was faking independent for some time and he really, you know, was signed to Def Jam. Now, I'm not going to name this artist because I don't want to put his business out there. But, you know, the artist has a song that's bubbling, doing really well. And I thought, okay, the song's doing well enough to probably catch the interest of Genius, right? Because Genius always does these verified interviews when a song starts to bubble. Um, And it's not that big of a deal to me. I just didn't understand why the artist didn't tell me, you know, and it's it's not like, hey, I wouldn't have made this connection if I knew you were signed. It just kind of threw me, right? So So I'm like, okay, I could probably connect some dots here. I know Genius likes to cover songs that bubble. His song is bubbling. It's doing really well. So I, I started to connect the dots. They, they want to set up the interview. They're working out the day. And then he like starts throwing all these other people on the email. Like all these people from Universal. Um, I'm like, yo, like I thought this was an independent operation. So it's not really about him. I just don't know maybe Payne or, or Aaron from your current experiences. Like uh, why are artists still faking independence? Does it does it matter at this point? I don't even think it mattered back then, to be honest, but like, is this still prevalent? Do you know a lot of artists that are still doing this? You do? Yes. So I don't know him personally, but yeah, it's like, it's almost daily. I find out somebody is signed and I'm like, when did they do that? So I don't know. 
I don't know. It could be like the labels because sometimes they want to wait until there's a big moment to even be affiliated with the artist, so to speak. But I don't get it as far as credibility because I feel like more people are attracted when it is like, oh, they got signed. Like somebody was independent and they were doing really well and then they got signed. So even for me, as somebody who champions for indies, I'm always really encouraged when an independent artist gets signed, especially to terms that they want. Like <clears throat> Montel Fish, he's a, like I'm friends with his manager and he was a big indie artist. Like he played our festival last year. Not that that has anything to do with it, but like I was a legitimate fan. Like he's just a dope artist. He just signed the craziest deal with Virgin and they announced it almost immediately because Virgin was like, we need to claim this because it was unbelievable that he signed. But he retained so much autonomy. So I like, I thought that was tight, but I don't know what it is. I think that people, I don't know. I think it's like the cool factor. I think that artists like to look like they're moving without anybody else's money as well too. I've seen artists, they're just like, oh yeah, we're doing this and this and this shit. And it's like, yeah, but you now have a hefty bag and a team behind it. So I think sometimes it may be the team who is trying to wait for a more significant win and then roll out the announcement. I know Rush just did that with the chick who won his competition on, um, he did the handsomer rap situation and I had an artist who was in the excellence academy and he was like man she just got signed and I was like this shit was already in the works like you think that she got signed off of a tiktok competition like that was just their way to figure out a way to announce her and then he kind of played it back and was like oh that makes sense I didn't even know who she was I just know that a lot of labels do this now where they'll do something to create a public deep smoke he was already signed <clears throat> he went on the youtube show you know and blew up but that Netflix. Netflix. The yeah, Netflix. Netflix. Netflix okay. Yeah. So he went on the Netflix show and blew up, but the label spent the money to make that the route for him to blow up. Do you know what I'm saying? That's no disrespect to him. Dude is talented. I really do think he was the best in the competition, but the label hedged their bets, right? So then when he got signed, everybody was like, oh my God, this is dope. It's like, no, this is the moment. So I think it's common because people are waiting for that big moment to announce. I do think it's a little bit odd and I find it to be kind of corny, but I think if you have a legitimate reason and a legitimate rollout plan, I understand it, but it is, it is a little odd that people are still pretending to be indie. I agree. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'm not, this, this isn't like my closest friend. Like we're cool. We've been in contact. I respect his, I respect his music, but I would have just appreciated a heads up. Cause I even asked him cause he started to, he started to get looks that he wasn't getting before, right? Like Lyrical Lemonade was posting him and there were just things that were happening. I was like, man, that's pretty impressive from an ind independent standpoint to, not that you can't get those looks, uh, but I did notice notice a shift. And I even asked him, I was like, yo, how are you getting, getting these looks? And he didn't tell me. So it's like, yeah, like now you're throwing people from Def Jam on, on the emails, like, Come on, bro. I'm I'm still gonna I'm still gonna help you. Like that's not gonna stop me. It's not like oh, he's with a label now. I can't help. Like I I want to because even it's not like your job is done when you get signed. It's still gonna be hard to really get to that to that level. Um, but I just I just think it's interesting. Um, the the Russ signing with with Caitlyn. Caitlyn actually I think she reached out to us. She I know she follows the the MEC. Um, I was surprised. Shout out to Caitlyn. I, I was surprised, not that she's a bad artist. I thought that I thought that Russ would because Russ could rap like Russ could really rap. And he's you know, he's well versed in the history of of hip hop. I know you laughing now, Aaron, but Russ can rap. You know, Russ can rap. In my opinion, he could rap. Um, That's not I, what I'm laughing at. I'm just laughing because I know the point that you're getting to. So, and I agree with you. I didn't think he was going to go this this route. Like she's more of like a poppy rapper. I thought he was going to like start it off with some folks that could really go. Um, well, what did he make most of his money on? I, yeah, I, I was going to say Russ, Russ had huge hits and they were very poppy. Like his breakthrough singles were very much in line with with what Caitlyn's wheelhouse is. Yes. Yeah, and then the fact mm -hmm. also that you know it wasn't a random signing. She already proved herself on on the remix, and that blew up 
more than the original. So it's kind of like. No, no, they, she was signed before that. Oh, she was. I didn't see. I didn't know that. So I. This is my speculation, but it's obvious that she was signed before that because she won the remix challenge, and then the remix dropped like a week and a half later, and then he announced her to be signed. That like, was a fake challenge. So. I don't want to catch any smoke. I didn't even know about who she was. And then one of my guys in the Excellence Academy was like, man, I felt like I had a way better remix. I had homies that I felt like had better remixes. And then she yeah. won. And then but she everybody says that. And everybody I was like, come that. on, bro. Nah. She was already on board to be signed. Paperwork don't move that fast. Yeah. I'm not going to be a conspiracy that I don't know. I'm not on Russ's team. But I saw some of the some of the in the some of the contestants in there. There were there were definitely, in my opinion, better people that came with versus. No disrespect to her. Shout right. out to no, you. She, no, out she's, to she's, she's, yeah, no, she's she's yeah, no, she's 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 cool. There's a lane for her, but I don't think she's, she's not cool. like a she's not like a spitter spitter. She's right. not, you she's know, just cool, right? She yeah. kind of got a little vibe. Yeah. Yeah. So so no, I think, you know, I think she could she could could probably do well in this industry with the right songs. Um, but you're not gonna throw her in a cipher. Like But were the artists more marketable and a better fit for the song than, than a female. That so, that's all I'm saying. No, and, and, I think that that stuff is opinion based, right? But I would be a little disappointed if the contest was rigged. Like if if that was and I, we're not saying that is the case, but that's I'm definitely whack. not saying that. I'm not that uh, that happens more often than you think it does. I'm just saying, if you look at the pacing of everything, you feel me? Like, if you look yeah. at the pacing of everything, I just know how long it takes to do business. You're not going to sign somebody who wins a competition that quickly. She's on tour with him. Do you know what I'm saying? I just, and no disrespect, like, I, I think it's dope. That's, that's how you do a good rollout. You create the moment for people to surmount to. So, like, I think that's cool. But, yeah, it's... I would be shocked if it wasn't something that wasn't pre-done, but I think that she's a, she's marketable. So it makes sense. Like he's one in the pop world. Women are up in hip hop. She's a cute white girl. There's, there hasn't been like a big cute white girl since um, what's her name? Who had fancy. Um, uh, Iggy uh, Azalea. Azalea. Yeah. I feel like there hasn't been like a big, Hip hop woman since her, and granted, Iggy had bars for a minute, but I could be wrong. I could just be out of it. <laughs> no, I knew some of Iggy's writing. I like, Pain's I like the way that. Iggy's, I Iggy's never Iggy's understood writers, the thing she said. I don't. So I'm just. Gonna so like, and she had that. Like she was from Australia, but she had like Houston writers and Atlanta writers. So I kind of liked what her writers had to say. No disrespect to them, but I get anybody not liking Iggy. I'm just saying there's not been <clears throat> white women in hip hop aren't typically very accepted or at least for a long time. So I think even with him going this route, he's going divergent. He's making it, you know, because I don't think he'd be able to. He could, but I don't know if he'd be able to lead a black woman through this industry. Do you know what I'm saying? But like getting a woman in the game and then getting behind her. And then he's got La Russell. I think he's smart in the way that he's going about branding his company. So I don't know. Shout out to what they got going on. But I'm like, I do. I do just want to say, though, that they already had her chosen. I was familiar with Caitlin at least a year before all this happened. And it was a lot of. She was building up a lot of social media momentum at, at at that point, and and I don't I don't mean to say social media momentum in some kind of general sense. It was very specific to to her identity as a as a rapper, um, and so it was songs. It was the the kind of TikTok style freestyles, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I. I uh, it makes it does it didn't feel totally out of nowhere 
just given that I know she already had a lot of viral moments that she created on her own. I'm not saying given like that. She's a good investment. That's what I'm saying. Like she's done yeah, she what is. needs to be done. She's developed her artistry. She's developed a core following on the internet. Now she's aligning with Russ. So that means that on the music side, people are going to respect it. I think that ha- holds more weight than great bars in a competition. So that's why to me, again, I don't think that she won just off of that competition. If you look at who she is as an artist, she's a good business bet, you know? <clears throat> and that's why I can commodify her. I don't want to make it sound like she's a commodity. She's a human, but she did what she needed to do. So my assumption is that he had already seen her. They had talked, they had worked through some things and then she kills this competition. I'm not saying she was the best, but she wasn't the worst for sure. It wasn't like, oh, this is terrible. But then she did the competition. Made, you know what I'm saying? So it's a natural progression. I think it's a good step. I hedge my bets the same way. We do our own competitions to culminate to a remix challenge that we already have. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just the industry at this point. But that you already have a winner for her? Well, I have like, yeah, I, I tell like I have we did a competition at Holy Smoke and I already knew one of the guys that I wanted to win because I loved his sound. So I made him apply. He still had to go through the application process. And then when my team chose, he was in the top 10. But if he wouldn't have been, I would have been like, put this dude in the top 10. I like his music. You know what I'm saying? So he rose to the top. I made him apply. But if he hadn't, I would have easily put him in because he's dope. Like. Like, I believe in nepotism. Anybody who says that they don't is lying or hasn't benefited from it. Like, literally, the world is built on nepotism. Yeah, I mean, that's different, though, than uh, like a contest, right? Like, I wouldn't I wouldn't rig a con. Like, I would encourage people that I think are dope to to uh, to enter. But like the the choice was never mine alone anyway. So I couldn't necessarily like rig the con. I mean, I guess I could have, I guess I could have been like, uh, all right, the way we're voting is changing and I'm the only person that can vote. Like, I guess I had the authority to do that, but I would have been super whack. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, these challenges and contests have some integrity because I think they're good opportunities for, for artists to participate, whether you win or not, actually, you know, I think whether you win or not, I think you should be participating in, um, in different challenges. I think Osmond Benjamin just won Joyner Lucas's. Um, I think he had a contest and he won like twenty five thousand. So not only is it an opportunity to win some money, but you're probably getting in front of some people that you that you weren't getting in front of before. So, but yeah, but I hope people hosting these competitions have have some integrity with it too. Um, but I know how how things are. Anyway, uh, we can go ahead and, and wrap it up. Any last words? My last words are join the Excellence Academy. I'm mentoring artists and producers and managers on how to be good at business. This is great. I love the MEC. If you want to step further, join the Excellence Academy, the excellenceacademy.biz. She basically saying Damon Payne don't know nothing. So if you really if you really want to know the business, you have to join this exclusive club. So this is like her funnel. This is her sales funnel. She gets to join the MEC. And just put up with me and paying for an hour and then drive people to the Excellence Academy where you really know, where you can really learn the business. Oh, the difference is that they can ask questions in real time. <laughs> this is great. I'm learning on this every day. So, no, I'm not shitting on our platform. I love the MEC. So, nah, she, join the Excellence Academy. What do you say, Payne? She's pulling a rust move on us. <laughs> yeah we never got invites to the excellence academy i don't even know what it is i mean i know what it is but i've never experienced and it that's why we're not excellent we're just kind of all right we're mediocre. yeah exactly we're the, i'm gonna bring y'all on as mentors we just start we start our second semester next week so now nah 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 me and me, me me and pain decided that we're gonna start our academy it's just gonna be called the regular academy so if y'all want to just be regular with me and pain Holla at us. It's half the price of excellence. Um, and you get two free months starting. I'm fake in, independent uh, <laughs> anyway. So if you, if you invite me as a mentor, you're going to start getting CCs with Def Jam and Universal Music Group staff anyway. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, holla at us. The regular academy, me and Payne. <laughs> All right. Once again, uh, appreciate you tuning in. 
Um, join the Excellence Academy and also join me every Tuesday on BeatStars.live from 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Looped In. Shout out to BeatStars. Shout out to Anjanette. It, it's just amazing. So, so the very first episode went down. Ricky P from Taylor Gang made three beats with with user submitted loops in that time. It was amazing. Um, I've never seen anything like it. I, I don't think any other platform has ever done anything like this. So, so tune in to that. It's obviously free. Submissions are free. You get three submissions a week um, at BeatStars.World slash opportunities. Check out Looped In. And we will catch you next time right here on the MEC podcast. But if you want to get uh, a text message from me every time I go live on Looped, Dame will let you know how to get, and I'll send you the text message personally. So Dame, how do they sign up to get alerts from me? All you got to do is text MEC to 844-206-7800. Um, and we'll send you a text with all the latest and greatest updates, excellent and regular. Um, so holla at us. Appreciate you for tuning in. Till next time, peace. Peace.